favorable financing conditions can be maintained with a moderately lower pace of net asset purchases. We've seen strong economic growth. However, challenges abound. Inflation may remain higher for longer than uh, we currently anticipate. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacqua. Well, good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. And here's what's coming up on today's program. Joe Biden urges Xi Jinping to cooperate on key issues in an attempt to revive bilateral ties. Well, even as a president of the two richest nations, spar on trade, human rights and Hong Kong. The ECB slows the pace of bond buying, but Christine Lagarde insists it isn't a move to wind down emergency stimulus. And Bank of America's Savita Subramanian likens the S&P to a 36-year zero-coupon bond as Deutsche Bank warns of increasing chances of a hard correction. So, first of all, good morning, everyone. We've made it to Friday. A quick check on the markets because it's where all of the action is doing. We were just talking about Deutsche Bank strategists saying that we could see a correction on the way. That is linked, of course, to some of the wobbles that we see in the markets this week. This has to do with some inflation expectations. It's not only growth, but what the central banks will do because of it. Now, this is technology stocks under pressure this week, today gaining some 2.6 percent. And that's kind of filtering through to the European stock 600. So there does seem to be a bit of relief after the volatile week that we've had, not only in Europe, but also in Asia. A reminder also when we had uh, that call between Presidents Xi and Biden, it's just given a little bit of a lift to the mood overall. The UK about taxes, we've been talking about it all week. We have some polling also for Boris Johnson, so we'll see whether it changes anything here in the UK. The FTSE MIB is unchanged. The CAC 40 uh, saying that actually they will not start an austerity plan and they're not going to move anything when it comes to some of the Treasury. So if you look at technology, basic resource and retail, that's definitely the biggest gainers and it's uh, telecoms, utilities, and healthcare that are under uh, pressure overall. Global stocks still remaining uh, very slightly close to some of these record highs. Now, the ECB lowering the pace of its bond purchases at yesterday's meeting. President Christine Lagarde was insistent that it was not a taper. The rebound phase in the recovery of the euro area economy is increasingly advanced. Inflation increased to 3% in August. We expect inflation to rise further this autumn, but to decline next year. The new staff projections foresee annual inflation at 2.2% in 21. We see the risks to the economic outlook as broadly balanced. The lady isn't tapering. Because what we are doing is recalibrating a PEP. I have to say, the newsroom, and actually I know I was on a couple of chat with traders, everyone was in uproar about that Thatcher reference at the end there by Christine Lagarde. Joining us to talk about the what we heard from the ECB taper and of course what it means for currencies is Elsa Lignos, Global Head of FX Strategy at RBC Capital Markets. Elsa, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Has your Euro dollar call moved at all? No, not at all. It's not just our call that hasn't moved. I think spot euro dollar barely moved as well, if you compare pre-ECB to post-ECB. Um, and I think just the net message we take from all of this is our vol traders who love to sell vol are still in the right camp. When you look at some of the hawkish messages that we saw from certain, you know, ECB members, from certain members also of the FOMC over in the U.S., when will they get there? Where? When can we actually start talking about tapering, Elsa? Well, I think the challenge at the moment is that you're in this situation with a temporary or what many people think is a temporary uptick in inflation, um, which is then expected to come back down. And if you think about the long and variable lags over which monetary policy acts, um, Jay Powell said that himself at Jackson Hole, it would be more of a mistake to kind of tighten at the wrong point in the cycle and then find that you have too tight policy um, at the moment when you, you don't need it. Um, and I think for now, the doves are certainly going to win that battle, because if you look on a policy relevant horizon, that kind of, you know, two year sweet spot, you don't have inflation picking up well above forecasts. So, Elsa, overall, is there a point where actually too much stimulus or too much accommodation becomes harmful? Or do you think that really, as you beautifully explained, the risks are on the other side right now? Well, I think it depends 
whose viewpoint you're taking. And certainly a lot of people in the market say, well, you know, the Fed or the ECB, many central banks are focused on inequality and income inequality, um, but there's also wealth inequality. There's other um, ways that you can see the stimulus expressing itself in financial markets. Um, but as long as policymakers are intent on delivering the stimulus until they see inflation picking up materially, you know, this is not a normative debate. We have to follow what they're telling us they're going to do. And um, what they're telling us at the moment is very clearly we're not going to raise rates, tighten policy, remove stimulus until we have material inflation. Um, Elza, could you actually see dollar renminbi going lower because the fact that President Xi and President Biden spoke on the phone for 90 minutes means that we could see a reset also of global relations? I think a reset might be taking it a step too far. It's always hard to judge the content of these phone calls, but just based on the readouts, um, it doesn't sound like any material progress was made. I think it's you know, it's certainly a positive sign that both leaders want to be seen to be engaging, but there are some very fundamental differences that remain. And so um, I wouldn't get too excited that we're going to see a, a complete turnaround in, in U.S.-Chinese relations. So uh, how much do you actually look at renminbi compared to someone else? If you were, Elsa, to give me your, you know, your biggest conviction in the FX space, what is it? So the renminbi, um, we are looking for a slight grind higher. Um, our Asia strategist has had that call for a while and, and continues to stand by that view. Um, but it's not the most exciting currency pair out there. I think at the moment, just given the environment we're in with a lot of central bank accommodation, we still really like um, some carry trades, but not the, the ones I think most would focus on, you know, the kind of short dollar long EM. Um, we've liked short Aussie MEX, for example, for the whole of this year, and it's a trade I still really like. You know, it picks up around 5% carry, and in this low-vol environment, that's no bad thing. Uh, Elza, I mean, we had quite a lot of news on the UK, uh, first of all, you know, about travel, COVID, but the biggest story is about tax increasing here. Does it change your call on sterling at all? I do, do think it's a little challenging for sterling, because I think if you remember earlier this year when we got the budget, um, there was a lot of uh, stimulus and maintaining fiscal support and very little in the way of, of paying it for it. Um, and if you look at the UK's imbalances, you know, the large current account deficit and um, the sizable budget deficit, it is something that needs to be addressed. And therefore, I do think going forward, fiscal policy will have to be that little bit tighter and, and therefore monetary policy as a result probably won't be able to tighten as much as some would hope. Elza, thank you so much. Elza Lignos, our Global Head of FX Strategy at RBC Capital Markets, joining us today. Now let's get more on today's market moves with our Ritika Gupta. So Ritika, what's the Friday trade starting to look like now? Yeah, Francine, it seems like we have a broadly overall positive sentiment, and you can see that Stock 600 up some two-tenths of a percent. And also we're seeing that in the U.S., minis up some four-tenths of a percent. That's after we've had four down days for the S&P 500. Then I want to quickly look at Treasuries. We see at one, sit at 132 on that 10-year. We've had pretty steady yields this week, and we've also had some pretty strong uh, auctions as well, showing that demand remains robust for those Treasuries. And then I want to take a look at our industrial metals, the likes of copper up some 1.6%, joining the likes of aluminum, steel, and what's shaping up to be a broadly positive day for commodities as well, Francine. So, Ritika, we also had some pretty bearish calls overnight from Deutsche Bank and Bank America. Yeah, Deutsche Bank joining the likes of its peers, Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, Morgan Stanley, all sounding the alarm about U.S. equities. They're now saying that they see a risk of a hard equity correction here. This, the combination of what's been extreme valuations, but also what they're saying is a rapidly advancing earnings cycle. So they're saying that those two together could pose a big risk. And we also had Bank of America's Savita Subr Subramaniam on, and she was talking about her raised call for the S&P 500 to 4250 from 3800 for this year. But this seems like a far cry away from capitulation, though, is particularly when you look at her call for next year, which seems just gains of 2%. So let's take a listen to what she had to say. The S&P 500 has essentially turned into a 36-year zero coupon bond. If you look at the duration of the market today, it's basically longer duration than it's ever been. So what that means is that any move higher in the cost of capital, be it interest rates, credit spreads, equity risk premia, that's basically going to be a huge knock on the market relative to, to the sensitivity we've seen in the past. 
So Savitia Subramaniam there saying that the market, well, it remains vulnerable, particularly to any rise in interest rates or a widening of those credit spreads. And she said the earnings expectations beat for this year, but those could come under pressure next year with that rising inflation and also any supply chain disruptions. Fancy. Ritika, thanks so much. Our reporter there, Ritika Gupta, looking at some of the market moves. Now, stay with Surveillance Early Edition. This hour, we'll discuss banking regulation with the Swedish banking minister, and then we'll speak to the winner of the Bold Future Award for British female entrepreneurs. That's Sharmadian Reid. But next, we talk green with the chief executive of carbon accounting firm Normative, Christian Ron. If you have any questions for our guests, just IB plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bluebrick Surveillance Early Edition, and I'm Francie Lacqua here in London. Now, the crucial climate conference of COP26 is just over 50 days away. Leaders are wrangling over climate commitments in an attempt to one-up the Paris Accord and agree to limit global warming to just 1.5 degrees. But while nations and large companies are critical in reaching net zero goals, getting small businesses on board will be just as important. Enter Normative. It's the software platform behind the SME Climate Commitment, which aims to help smaller companies track and account for their carbon emissions. Now, it has just received a 1 million euro grant through the Google Impact Challenge on Climate with a goal to make their technology as accessible as possible. Well, joining us now is Christian Ron, founder and chief executive of Normative. So, Christian, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, I think the first question is that when I speak to a lot of chief executives from small and medium-sized enterprises, they say, I want to do good, I want to do well, but actually it's just pricey for me and expensive. So is it that, the, the you know, is a barrier that it's difficult to measure these emissions or actually that small and medium-sized enterprises are reluctant to do it? That, that's an excellent question, and thanks a lot for having me on the show. Uh, so I think it's mainly a barrier. I mean, you have 400 million small businesses around the pla planet that is struggling with the reality of climate change. But in order to go towards net zero, you first need to be able to track your emissions, because in the end, what gets measured gets managed. And the particularly hard part to account for is the indirect emissions uh, from your suppliers and the supply chain, which typically accounts for over 90% uh, of the total emissions. Uh, so our mission at Normative is to democratize carbon accounting by making it super easy to account for your emissions for every single invoice and, and every single uh, transaction uh, throughout, throughout the supply chain, regardless of, of the size of your business. Right. So, Christian, how do you do that? Is, that? is it actually an approximation? I know we've all used, you know, calorie counting apps or whatever you eat apps. Is it that kind of idea, but to understand how much you're polluting or how much you're emitting and your suppliers are? A again, great question. So the starting point is always an approximation. So what we do is, is that our clients they upload data from their uh, open banking or accounting system, all of the invoices. And based on that, we can see how much have they spent on electricity or fuel for their cars or, or certain raw materials. And, and based on that, we approximate the emissions of all of those activities. And I think the important thing here is that we give them a highlight of what should you prioritize. I mean, what, which are your biggest hotspots and what are the actions that you can take in order to go towards uh, net zero, uh, and, and then you can, of course, improve on, on your emissions calculations as you go along. So, uh, Christian, how many people use, you know, normative, and how many people you think are not using it, companies, because then they, in, they think it's expensive to then adjust it? I mean, if you see a problem, then you have to do something about it. Yep. I, I think, again, excellent point. Uh, I think the important part here is that it's actually not expensive to take climate action. I mean, the cost of solar is now lower than, than fossil fuels and in general, the cost of, of, of sustainable energy. Um, so, so the cost is usually not the issue. It is the tracking and the accounting, uh, which is the hard part. And, and today we have 
uh, a few hundred companies that are using the software, but through our collaboration with uh, the UK government and, and the SME Climate Hub, which is a part of the Race to Zero, we have thousands of companies signing up for a net zero commitment. And that is why we're super excited uh, about um, the support that we get from google.org and the fellowship program. So they will in fact yeah. uh, send us some of their brightest engineers to offer our software platform uh, for free for anyone that signs up uh, through the Race to Zero campaign and, and that take a net zero commitment. Um, Christian, how much more though, you know, it, it, does it have to be mandatory? How much more do we need to do to make sure that there's a real difference? There's a lot of companies worried about greenwashing. There's a lot of companies saying, look, the way we count it is just not the right way in how it gets into the real economy. So what do you need to make a real difference? Yeah, I think what we need in the end is, is first, uh, pension funds and large financial institutions need to start to demand uh, carbon accounting as a part of their uh, due diligence processes. And this is already happening in, in Europe uh, through the sustainable disclosure regulation. Uh, then secondly, it needs to be easy to account for your emissions. And you need to have comparable emissions numbers between legal entities. And that is why uh, you know encoding the accounting principles in, into software is so uh, incredibly important. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Christian Ron, there, Normative Chief Executive. Of ha I have a feeling we'll interview you again. We'll have plenty more, of course, on ESG, on reporting, especially after the probe and the pressure we see on a lot of the asset managers. Right. Uh, just seconds ago, we had a break news out of China. This is on the back also of that 90-minute telephone call between Presidents Biden and Xi. That was late last night. Now, Chinese regulators, we understand, are meeting 10 platform companies over labor issues. Now, these are Meituan, Didi, Alibaba, Tencent. We understand they are among the companies that have met with regulators. Um, regulators ask those companies to protect gig economy workers. Again, it goes back to some of the disorderly capital uh, news that we heard from China. So China trying to clean up the act, saying, look, it's not all about profits. You also have to treat your workers in the right way. So we'll have a full roundup of any China news. Stay with Surveillance Early Edition this hour. We'll also discuss banking regulation with the Swedish banking minister. We'll speak to the winner of the Bold Future Award for British female entrepreneurs, Shermadine Reed. If you have any questions for any of our guests, please just IB plus TV go. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's take a look at some of the things that you need to watch out for today. At 11.30 a.m. UK time, the Bank of Russia announces its rate decision, which will be followed by trade and GDP figures. Then, 1.30 p.m. UK time, the latest Canadian unemployment figures will be released. At 1.30 p.m., we'll have data from the U.S., including wholesale inventories and PPI. And then a little bit later, EU economic and financial affairs ministers gather in Slovenia for an informal meeting. And that could move the markets. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine, and happy Friday. Fed Presidents Robert Kaplan and Eric Rosengren say they are selling all their stock holdings by the end of the month amid ethical concerns about their trading activity. The Dallas and Boston Fed Presidents released near-identical statements after their financial disclosures showed investments in stocks and other financial instruments. Both said they will invest the proceeds in diversity diversified index funds or in cash. UK wholesale electricity prices surged 2.3 thousand pounds a megawatt hour for a period earlier this week as Europe continues to face an energy crunch. The peak was more than 10 times the price seen the following morning, highlighting the current extreme of volatility in the market. Low winds, along with the lack of natural gas supply across the continent, are making the situation worse, with record prices seen in 
in Spain, Germany and France. And North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has shown off a thinner frame, a trace of a tan and even a new haircut as he inspected a military parade. No major new weapons were on display with Homeland Security, a greater focus at the country's first military parade since US President Joe Biden did take office. But the new look Kim is indeed drawing attention after his noticeable weight loss over the past a few months. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrins. This is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, I have to admit yesterday, so that headline crossed the Bloomberg terminal actually saying Kim Jong-un is trimmed hand and loving the parade. And of course, everyone rushed to see exactly what all the fuss was about. There is, and I know there's been like some also, you know, psychological experts, given his body language, because it's such a mysterious country, it's very difficult to know what he does next. So I think, you know, foreign affairs experts are saying if he looks more relaxed, maybe um, things will de-escalate. Well, Francine, he did show off a new haircut, which was representative of his grandfather's haircut. And as we have seen, we don't know a lot about the re regime, but we'll keep our eye on it. Yeah, and he was smiling. Stay with Surveillance Early Edition. Joe Biden urges President Xi to cooperate on key issues in an attempt to revive bilateral ties, even as the presidents of the two richest nations spar on trade, human rights and Hong Kong. The ECB slows the pace of bond buying, but Christine Lagarde insists it isn't a move to wind down emergency stimulus. And coming up, we speak to the winner of the Bold Future Award for British female entrepreneurs, Sharmadine Reid, and we discuss banking regulation with the Swedish banking minister, Asa Lindhagen. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, Joe Biden has called Chinese leader Xi Jinping over his frustration with dead-end talks between the countries. The call was a second between the two leaders and comes at a time of increased tension in their relationship. Biden hoped that the more personal engagement with Xi would help advance cooperation on both sides. Well, here to discuss all of this is Bloomberg's international government reporter, actually editor, Roz Matheson. Roz, always great to speak to you. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. So what does this actually tell us about ties between Biden and Xi? Well, the optics of the call are quite interesting. It was a 90-minute call and their first one since February, and it was initiated by the U.S. president, who clearly, as you say, is going frustrated at the lack of progress in ties. But the sense from the readouts is that Xi Jinping wasn't exactly warm on the call. They may have had an open chat, but it doesn't seem that Biden got whatever momentum he was seeking. And rather, Xi Jinping is pushing everything together, saying you cannot separate trade, human rights and issues like Hong Kong. And at the same time, Xi is very focused on domestic matters in the run-up to a big leadership meeting in China in the early part of next year and on his campaign to ensure a greater distribution of wealth, uh, what he calls common prosperity. And he doesn't seem all that interested as a result in offshore matters. So from where he sits, he's probably happy just to let things with the U.S. stay as they are for now. So not any worse, but also not any better either. Yeah. So, Roz, does this pave the way for a meeting at the G20? Well, usually you would get the China side pushing for a meeting at a big summit like that. It's a chance for Xi to be met on an equal footing, to be recognised as a senior leader and so on, and to use those one-on-one -on -one moments to sort out things like trade. He's done that quite well, for example, with the former president, Donald Trump. But again, there's no great sense that China is pushing for the same at the Rome G20 or at the COP26 climate meeting either. In fact, there's not even clarity on whether Xi will show up in person. He's not left China now for 600 days during the pandemic. He's attended everything virtually. And what we're hearing at the moment is that the G20 hosts Italy are in fact growing a bit worried that he may not even show up. So if Biden thought the G20 was the chance to finally spend some time in person, it's very unclear that that would even happen. Ros, thank you so much. Or Rosalind Matheson there, of course, uh, who oversees all of our coverage of international government. Meanwhile, Joe Biden announced new measures requiring federal workers and millions of health care workers to be vaccinated against the virus. Now, those who don't comply could be dismissed and private employers could actually be fined. Here's what he said. The Department of Labor is developing an emergency rule 
to require all employers with 100 or more employees that together employ over 80 million workers to ensure their workforces are fully vaccinated or show a negative test at least once a week. Some of the biggest companies are already requiring this. United Airlines, Disney, Tyson's Food, and even Fox News. This is not about freedom or personal choice. It's about protecting yourself and those around you. Well, that was President Biden. And of course, this is just one of the main challenges that governments around the world face to make sure that there's not pockets of unvaccinated citizens that then spread and get sick with COVID-19. Now, let's also turn to green finance and new EU sustainable finance rules could raise compliance risks for fund managers especially in light of the greenwashing probes into sustainability disclosures by DWS. Well, we're very pleased to welcome Sweden's Minister for Financial Markets, Asa Lindhagen, to talk about all of this. Minister, thank you so much for making the time to come on Bloomberg. I mean, this is probably one of the most important conversations of our time. What do some of these probes tell us? Have you had conversations with your banks, with other banks around the world, in saying they want to make sure what they have in their books so that they're not greenwashing? Well, of course, this is, uh, I mean, uh, uh, one of our biggest uh, challenges that we're facing now around the world and, uh, and in, in Sweden and in all countries in the world, uh, it is the climate crisis. And I think that more and more people uh, are getting aware of, of uh, what huge crisis this is and that we need to act. So, of course, the financial sector uh, has a crucial role to to play in the green transition. I mean, we need to uh, uh, direct capital towards uh, activities that are sustainable, and, and we need to uh, to manage this crisis uh, because it's, uh, I mean, uh, it could uh, uh, damage uh, the possibilities for, for mankind to, to live on, on this planet. So, uh, yeah. of course, that is uh, very important to discuss, for example, greenwashing. So, Minister, is existing legislation in the EU, including SFDR, actually enough to stop greenwashing in, amongst financial actors? I do think we need to do uh, many things. And, and right now we have uh, the EU taxonomy, which is uh, a work being done by the EU Commission to define what is uh, sustainability. I mean, uh, a huge uh, challenge uh, these days is that we have different definitions of of what is sustainable, and and we need to have common definitions in order to to increase transparency and and make it easier for for uh, investors to make informed decisions. If I want to to invest in in uh, green activities, what what is uh, what is uh, green activity? So I think the EU taxonomy is uh, very very important uh, in in the future. Will have uh, will play a, a crucial role if we if we uh, manage to, to uh, I mean, to, um, to have it in, in, in place and, yeah. and uh, get it working in a good way. So, uh, Minister, do you think that actually regulators need to take a more active role in this? Yes, I do. I, I uh, definitely think that we all need to uh, take more action, and that includes, of course, also uh, politicians, we need to be braver, we need to work faster. And also, of course, the actors in the financial sector need to ask themselves, what can we do to contribute to the green transition? And and this is also a matter of, of uh, handling climate-related risks. I mean, climate risks are financial risks. Uh, so uh, if you don't uh, deal with these risks, uh, it's, it is a huge risk for your business. Uh, it's a huge risk of doing in investments uh, that uh, will end up to be, uh, I mean, uh, worthless if it, uh, in, in the worst case scenario. So that is also important to, to be, uh, increase the capacity in the financial sector to deal with the climate related yeah. risks. But so, uh, Minister, I mean, there was the IPCC report saying that actually the, the, glo the planet is warming a, a lot faster than we think it is. So how crucial and how urgent is it for the EU, for example, to get financial actors and industries to stop allowing capital to get to corners where actually this is enabled, that it's delaying the shift away from carbon? It's extremely urgent, and I think the last... IPCC report is uh, is very very clear on that. Uh, 
uh, we we need to to stop also investing in fossil new fossil energy and and we need to do this transition otherwise uh, we uh, we face great great risks uh, all over the planet and uh, and uh, everyone needs to to take responsibility in this uh, shift Will you impose tougher rules in Sweden if you think that the EU is, is a little bit behind the curve on this? Well, I do think we need uh, to uh, to take more steps from uh, uh, the political uh, side. And, and one thing we have also in place right uh, nowadays is uh, the disclosure regulation in the European Union that, uh, I mean, it's uh, now uh, the uh, asset manager need to report on on their uh, on uh, how sustainable the investment uh, is so that investors can make more informed decisions on, on sustainability. And uh, we have already had that kind of regulation in, in Sweden uh, before the European Union. So I think we need to uh, continue to, to be ahead of, of, of progress and, and show other countries that it is possible with the green transition and also, of course, mm -hmm. learn from other countries that take uh, important steps forward. I mean, this is a, it's not a time to, to wait and see. This is a time for action for all of us. Minister, thank you so much. Sweden's Minister for Financial Markets, Asa Lindhagen there. Now, smart conversations continue on Bloomberg Surveillance. Early edition up next, we speak to this year's winner of the Bold Future Award for British female entrepreneurs, Sharmadine Reed. She's the founder of the Stack World, a networking and content platform for women. Now, if you have any questions for her, just IB Plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacla here in London. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. The world's number one car maker is cutting its production outlook. Toyota will make 9 million units over the fiscal year to March, 300,000 fewer cars than actually planned. It says the spread of the coronavirus in Southeast Asia is to blame. Now, Amazon says it will pay college tuition for some frontline employees in the U.S. The company will spend an extra $1.2 billion by 2025 on the package, including for the first time paying the complete costs of college tuition. And Amazon is the latest big employer to offer educational perks to attract workers in a tight labor market. And Goldman Sachs is dropping social distancing rules in its London office and returning to full occupancy starting next week. An internal memo seen by Bloomberg says about half of the banks in London workers are already in the office each day. It will retain mask wearing in common areas and mandatory testing. Free food is also going, which Goldman says will support local restaurants. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francie, no more free food for Goldman workers. I, I know. I mean, this has the story has everyone up in arms. I, you know, there are bigger stories out there, but I know it's definitely getting a lot of the finance um, experts talking, especially some of the employees, only the employees. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, our next guest is this year's winner of the Bold Future Award, honoring the best of female entrepreneurship in Britain. Sharmadine Reed is the chief executive and founder of the Stack World. The Stack World is a networking platform for women that launched this year and has raised more than three million pounds in funding. While Sharmadine previously founded the London nail bar Wah Nails and Beauty Stack, a beauty professionals network. Well, we are delighted to have Sharmadine Reed, chief executive and founder of the Stack World, joining us today. Sharmadine, first of all, congratulations. Thank you so much. And you made it nice and early in the studio of the next course. day. So that's even better. Sharmadine, like, you have an amazing journey. And actually, you know, this kind of was recognized last night. Um, with this award, when you started building your businesses, what was the, the toughest thing about it? Was it is, was it funding? Was it getting support? Was it you know breaking through? 
I would say that for women in general, getting started is not often the hardest part, right? It's like we've had the last decade of female entrepreneurship being a buzzword, you know, boss culture being a buzzword. I actually think the hardest part is scaling. I think that women often get their foot in the door these days through amazing networks and opportunities, but do they have the mentorship or sponsorship or advocacy to essentially take their business to the next level? So what I mean by that is, how many women do you read about re raising Series A, Series B, Series C, or even IPOing? It's so, it's a rarity, you know. So that's the challenge. But this is what lack of mentors, or it's is. I mean, how do you explain that? I would say that it's definitely being out of a club of access to knowledge and network. So I would say, um, in my experience, I found selling the vision really easy, selling the mission really easy. But then when it comes to hiring the best employees, how many men, you know, male engineers might want to work for a female founder or even knowing the path to raising your next funding. It's something you kind of have to prepare a year before. So I would say it's definitely been part of the network works of power. Um, to me, I think women are still locked out of them despite rising stats. So do you think that's changing though, slowly? I mean, it's, it's kind of a glacial pace. It's, that's the but, thing. People love celebrating, you know, 30% of board members now are women, but it's still not 50%. So it's like, okay, cool, celebrate one, but how are we going to get there faster? Yeah. So things are changing, but I think there's all of these tiny little unspoken ways that women are held back that aren't actually you know in a handbook for example um, talk to me about the stack world sure so the stack world uh, we launched it earlier this year we're on track for 10,000 paying members which is great it's been growing about 28 percent month on month it's really exciting and it comes from around 15 years of me working with women mm -hmm. um, seeing what stops them getting and to me it was that knowledge as i said earlier so we provide editorial content on women role models how to get your first 10,000 customers etc the second part is the network so we connect all of our readers together digitally and then the final part is the commerce. So imagine, um, you know, women buying and selling from each other, whether it's professional services, like I need a lawyer or I need a mortgage broker. You know, property is a hot topic for, for our audience right now. So I'm like knowledge, network, commerce, all digitally, but also lots of face-to-face -face meetups these days. And my goal is to essentially create a global network of women trading with other women. How big do you want it to be? And actually, you know, you said the one thing that maybe holds women back is, is not having the support or, you know, the Series A, B, and C. This is, in general, more of a problem of European founders also and European companies compared to the U.S. Yeah, it's true. I would say I want it to be as big as it can be. We're half the population, right? So half the world. Um, no, I think, I think for me I'll be really satisfied if we have a global audience a global network of you know millions that are all bought into the stat world mission it's essentially a new alumni what do you need now to be to be you know to be bigger is it funding You've just so we are fundraising right yep. now which is really exciting and it's moving very fast um, but it's not just for me the cash and I think that anyone who is involved in uh, venture capital or private equity should think not only can I support female entrepreneurship and equality with money but how can I open doors for these female entrepreneurs so who can I introduce them to how can I coach them on deal making how can I help them with their commercials do you, you know what I mean so I think like that is the way that you help women get to this next stage in their career and I mean, is there a question that they always ask you? Is there a question? What's the, the number one question that you get over and over? Is there a big enough market? <laughs> I always get that. In fact, it's not just me. Many of my female founders, I'm part of many like female founder groups. That question gets asked over and over again. I'm not sure it's a big enough market. But again, half the citizenship of the world. So it's pretty big. Sharmadine, thank you so much thank for you joining so us. Sharmadine Reed there, Chief Executive and Founder of The Stack World. Now, Ken Mullis says Wall Street's talent war may drive up junior banker pay even further. Up next, we hear from our exclusive interview. This is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, an intense talent war on Wall Street that has forced firms to raise starting pay for junior bankers to north of six figures. Among those raising pay for analysts to lure new recruits and prevent defections is Mullis & Co. Its founder, Ken Mullis, tells Bloomberg he's prepared to bump up pay even further next year. The m and business has gone, from, like you said, 20 years ago it was a tactic. You went to the GE board, just to pick a name, and it was a tactic to get a strategic opportunity done, and you may or may not do it. Today it's actually an industry, meaning there are firms that are in the business of doing m and they, 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 they get given money, 25 billion, some of them, 30 billion, I think we'll see a $50 billion fund before the next five to seven years are out. And they, they want to do transactions. Now, they also delegate down to junior talent like we are. So the biggest checkbook in the world 20 years ago was Jeff Immelt's maybe at GE. And today, a 37-year-old at a major PE firm may have a bigger M&A checkbook than the Fortune 10 did 20 years ago. You think we'll see a $50 billion private equity fund? Oh, definitely. I mean, people forget that in 2000, when KKR did the big millennial fund, it was like $5 billion, and that was only 20 years ago. I think, and I'm not up to say, I think KKR reported that they raised $67 billion in the first quarter. So, look, the acceleration of capital into private equity, um, the attributes of it, I can't see why it wouldn't happen. Add leverage, it's firepower of 250 to $300 billion. It's mm -hmm. remarkable. Markets have grown. Ken, I've always known you as someone who will go anywhere and talk to anyone if there's business to be had, even if it means getting up in the middle of Thanksgiving dinner to catch a plane, um, a story we can tell later. <laughs> what about China? Do you agree with George Soros that doing business in China is no longer morally justifiable because it's tantamount to supporting a totalitarian regime? No. And the reason I don't agree is not that I have some, is that I'm a business person. And uh, you know, there are politicians who make that. I think the, the, world, the, the amount of business people that are getting involved in these issues because they think there's only one side of an issue. Look, the reason things are issues is because there's two sides to it. Um, China is something that our government should deal with uh, as, in that sense. Um, in, in my world, uh, you know, I try to look at business as business, um, and I think there's way too much pressure or way too much uh, focus on, on business trying to get involved in issues. Let me tell you, most of these issues are 55-45 or 60-40, and there's a lot of people who think there's clarity on what side you should be on, and I, I think it's very dangerous. Well, that was Ken Mollis uh, talking with Bloomberg's Eric Schatzker about the intense war for talent on Wall Street and investments in China. Now, in the meantime, let's also have a look at what markets are doing. Now, there has been a bit of a wobble over the week overall, but today global stocks remaining in sight of record levels uh, following the week that, uh, well, saw a lot of risks coming at the forefront to elevate inflation, slower economic recovery, and less generous monetary policy. The one thing we're looking at very closely is renminbi on the back of uh, some of the things that we heard from China, and of course, that President Xi, President Biden called that lasted 90 minutes yesterday. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller joins us out of Berlin. Kaylee Lines will be in New York. This is Bloomberg. Favorable financing conditions can be maintained with a moderately lower pace of net asset purchases. We've seen strong economic growth. However, challenges abound. Inflation may remain higher for longer than uh, we currently anticipate. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacqua, Matt Miller, and Keely Lines. Well, it's 10 a.m. here in London, 11 a.m. Berlin, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Friday, September 10th. Our top stories today. Biden's shot at the unvaccinated. The president orders millions of healthcare workers, government employees, and federal contractors to get the vaccine. Battling with Beijing, President Biden also makes a late-night call to President Xi after months of lower-level talks to improve relations 
reach a dead end. And sell-off at the central bank, two regional Fed presidents promised to get rid of their individual stock holdings in a move to end questions about their trading. So there is quite a lot of stories out there. Also, happy Friday. I know, Kaylee, uh, Matt and I have been waiting for Friday for if, what feels like forever this week. Kaylee, if you look at uh, stocks, they're nearing record highs despite the wobble we had this week on economic growth forecast and inflation. Yeah, markets in Asia certainly very happy that it is Friday, Francine, because we did see a rebound after yesterday's relatively steep losses. Anywhere you look basically across the region, it was in the green. All major equity benchmarks really in positive territory. You had Japan resuming its rally with the Nikkei up about one and a quarter percent. And in China, the Shanghai Composite actually closed at its highest level since 2015. The rebound in Chinese equities really led by tech stocks. The Hang Seng Tech Index up about 2.3%. 8% or so, actually recovering about half of their losses from yesterday. We got some clarification overnight. Apparently, China isn't freezing all new video game approvals. They're just going to slow them down. So that's aiding sentiment. And of course, speaking of sentiment, traders also weighing the conversation that took place over the phone last night between President Biden and Pro Chinese President Xi Jinping. And after news of that phone call, the Chinese yuan is an outperformer in Asian foreign exchange. It's stronger against the dollar by about three tenths of 1%. At the same time, the Japanese yen is actually the only currency in Asia or in G10 weaker against the dollar today to the tune of about two tenths of 1%. Now here in the U.S., we are coming off of four days of losses for the S&P 500, but judging from futures trading, we may break that losing streak today because S&P 500 futures are up a little uh, shy of half of 1%. In the bond market, you are seeing some selling. The 10-year yield up about three basis points. We're sitting right around that 132 level. And then I wanted to point to what we're seeing in commodities, both the industrial metals, which are seeing a broad-based mm -hmm. rally, copper futures up about 2%, but also oil. Of course, we got the news yesterday that China is releasing oil reserves. That took crude low. But a rebound taking shape on this Friday morning. WTI up about 1.6%, trading at 69.26 a barrel, Matt. Yeah, there is so much going on in oil today, Kaylee. I mean, I'm really focused on it's not just China intervening, but the U.S. in a sense intervening as well, right? The U.S. releasing more of its strategic reserves to Exxon, now a total of 3 million barrels. The uh, output in the U.S. dropped the most on record after Hurricane Ida, Shell declaring force majeure, and um, in, in gas, there's even more news. There's a big gas crunch here in Europe, and Nord Stream 2 is now open for business. The Russians say they've finished it, and the Germans can commence purchases um, from Moscow whenever they are ready. Take a look at um, the green on the screen here in Europe. For the most part, we see the Iberian Peninsula not moving very much, but France um, gaining, and the, those gains are a little bit more than we see in the UK and in Germany. I want to actually focus in on the stocks 50 today rather than the stock 600. It's sort of like the Dow of Europe, and it's really only continental Europe or only the EU, right? The UK stocks are not in the Euro stocks 50, and it's a much stronger gainer as a result because London isn't showing the kind of gains that we're seeing here on the continent. You can see it's up about two thirds of 1%. The Bunds right now, negative 34, negative 35 basis points. And we saw the Euro at 118 and change. Not a lot of movement in European um, FX or in uh, European rates, even though we all paid attention to Christine Lagarde um, tell us she's not tapering yesterday. You do see some movement higher in the pound, 138.77. And then I put Brent crude in here just to show you the global benchmark. I mean, Kaylee made a point to show you NYMEX crude. We did see a big dip in those both yesterday, but especially Brent, right, as China intervened. And Brent is also bouncing back at a stronger rate, Fran. Yeah, Matt, I wonder whether that differential between the UK and, for example, the CAC 40 has to do with taxes, of course, Emmanuel Macron. Absolutely. Uh, eight months away for, from that election. Now, look at what else is ahead today. Russia in focus with the central bank expected to deliver a fifth straight rate hike as prices continue to run hot. Now, Canada releases its jobs numbers at 8.30 a.m. New York time. It's set to see a slowdown in job creation. Then at 9 a.m. New York time, Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester speaks virtually at a Bank of Finland conference on monetary policy. Now over to Washington where President Biden is ordering federal workers and millions of health care workers to be vaccinated. He's also issuing rules for large private employers to mandate shots or testing. Well, he spoke at the White House yesterday. The Department of Labor is developing an emergency rule to require all employers with 100 or more employees that together employ over 80 million workers 
to ensure their workforces are fully vaccinated or show a negative test at least once a week. Some of the biggest companies are already requiring this. United Airlines, Disney, Tyson's Food, and even Fox News. This is not about freedom or personal choice. It's about protecting yourself and those around you. Let's get straight to Emily Wilkins, a Bloomberg government reporter, joining us from Washington. Emily, this is really President Biden stepping up his fight against the Delta variant. Absolutely, Francine. What we're seeing right here is President Biden really hardening his stance, particularly with federal employees who are now required to get vaccinated. Before that, they could have opted for a test and really pushing on businesses with more than 100 people, saying that these businesses either need to put in vaccine mandates in place, aggressive testing, or face fines of thousands of dollars from the U.S. Department of Labor. So there's really a big step up here, and it kind of comes as we've hit this point where even though the vaccine is a widely available, free, has been for months, you still have a large chunk of American adults who are not taking that vaccine. And that's really holding up certain things, such as the economy coming fully back, things really beginning to open up again as it was post-pandemic. And let's take a wider look at the politics here for a minute. I mean, remember when President Biden began his presidency, it was very much focused on ending COVID-19. It seemed like they were accomplishing that for a while with an increasing number of Americans getting vaccinated but we sort of hit this plateau at this point plus the delta variant has complicated things yeah. and this is clearly president biden's attempt to get the narrative back under control well president biden would also like to see his economic agenda pass through congress emily and we are seeing progress we had several house committee votes yesterday on pieces of that three and a half trillion dollar socially oriented spending what do we know about the composition at this point so nothing too surprising about the composition. It's all stuff that we've been discussing for months now, right? Paid family leave, uh, help with child care, help with elder care, a pre-K uh, assistance with the first two years of community college, all things that we've widely discussed. Now we're just getting the details of them hammered out and we're expecting to see more. The tax proposal in particular, the mechanism that will pay for a lot of this bill and raise corporate taxes as well as taxes on wealthy individuals. We're expecting to see text on that in the next next couple days and see that be marked up by a committee next week. But we also saw fractions emerging within Democrats as well. We saw moderate Democrats, Stephanie Murphy of Florida, come out and say that they do have some concerns with how quickly the process is moving, the fact that they haven't had time to review some of these proposals, and there could be more individuals like her. This could potentially become another big roadblock for this legislation passing in the House. Emily, thanks very much. Emily Wilkins there from Bloomberg government talking to us about what's going on inside the Beltway. Now, the Biden administration is growing more frustrated over talks with China as well. In a phone call last night, President Biden urged China's Xi Jinping to cooperate on key issues, even while the two battle over other topics. Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie joins us for more. So, Tom, what are the key issues and what are the other topics? Well, the key issues are numerous, Matt, of course, ranging from everything from human rights to trade to, to technology. Uh, but this was an important call, of course, because it's the first time uh, since February that the two leaders have actually set up a call that lasted for 90 minutes. And the reason for this was President Biden and the White House who initiated this call was because they are frustrated over in the U.S. that they haven't been able to make more progress on issues like climate change when John Kerry uh, went over to China just in the last few months. It was that frustration that led to this call. President Biden Biden hoping that a personal relationship with Xi Jinping can move the dial on some issues. China coming out and saying they are in favor of cooperation, but not just on U.S. terms. So we did have a little bit of a change. I mean, today we also had a little bit more on some of the technology stocks, mm. a little bit of pressure. So how does it all pan out? Well, certainly in the markets, we saw a bit of relief when it comes to those Chinese tech stocks because there was some moderation around the reporting from the South China Morning Post, which yesterday came out and said there was going to be a ban on online games. They moderated that now. So a bit of relief fitting into those uh, shares, certainly. Uh, and that led to that optimism in, in the Chinese markets today. That's on the tech front. Certainly technology is a key concern for President Xi Jinping, the need to ease some of those restrictions because he's very aware that Chinese companies need access to the hardware and software uh, from the U.S. It's increasingly been restricted. But trade is another question. And the Chinese have said this a number of times. They want to see tariffs removed. On the trade front, though, you're seeing exports to China, to the U.S., out of China, uh, at very high levels. Indeed, the surplus is very much back. Uh, so far, China is showing no signs they're going to make any concessions in this relationship. 
All right, Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie, great roundup. Thank you so much. And turning now to the Fed, because Boston Fed Chief Eric Rosengren and Dallas Fed's Robert Kaplan said they are selling their individual stock holdings. This, of course, is following ethical concerns over their trading activity last year. Let's get more on this with Bloomberg's Ritika Gupta. So, Ritika, technically what they did followed the rules, but people were quite upset about it. Talk to us about the specifics of their investments. Yeah, okay, Kaylee, there's been calls and outcry for more accountability. This is after it came out that Fed officials had been buying and selling individual stocks and securities during 2020. This was a year when the Fed had been propping up financial markets with some of those uh, emergency measures. And now Fed's Eric Rosengren and Robert Kaplan coming out and saying that they will sell those individual securities by the end of September to try and appease some of these uh, calls for more ethical standards. They said that they will put those funds, those proceeds into index tracking funds or hold them in cash. But many critics just saying, well, it's far too late and that the damage is done. This is as the Fed has been boosting their monetary stimulus and it's deemed really to have been uh, maybe benefiting more those American, uh, wealthy Americans, excuse me, rather than the general population. And as to your question on the specifics of their investments, well, Eric Rosengren, for his part, he disclosed that he'd been buying and selling four real estate investment trust shares. And this raised some concern and raised some eyebrows because he'd been one of those warning about the commercial real estate market and that it could be overheating. He'd actually been advising the Fed to scale back some of its mortgage-backed uh, security purchases mm. at a quicker rate than treasuries to avoid some of that overheating. As for Robert Kaplan, well, he'd been uh, buying and selling shares of the iShares floating rate bond ETF. Now, this uh, tracks bonds with maturities under five years, which we know the Fed can impact those prices and yeah. have influence over them through the Fed funds rate. So all in all, critics saying that, yes, it was uh, might not it might have been prohibited, but still it's a call of lack of judgment and has really damaged the Fed's reputation, Kaylee. All right, Bloomberg's Ritika Gupta, thank you so much. And speaking of stocks and who's holding them or not, let's take a look at some stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. A big mover to the upside is Affirm. Of course, the buy now, pay later company. It reported after the bell last night, topped expectations. One analyst over at True is saying it's very strong and he continues to expect strength. He raised his price target to $120 a share. It's trading at 114 this morning, up about 24% in pre-market trading. Another stock moving to the upside is Zscaler, also a company that reports and beat after the bell last night. It, of course, is a security software company and its shares are higher by a little more than 2%, nearly 3% in early hours. But one mover to the downside is Apellis Pharmaceuticals. The company said yesterday only one of its late stage trials for geographic atrophy treatment met its goal and that stock getting punished for it this morning, Francine, down about 30% before the bell. Yeah, we'll have plenty more on that. And of course, we'll have plenty more on vaccines, vaccinations and the jabs. Coming up in the next hour, Luke Kawa, UBS Asset Management Director of Investment Solutions, will talk about some of the Deutsche Bank calls, including some banks calling for a correction. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in Berlin with Francine Lacroix in London and Kaylee Lines in New York. Now, there is so much going on in the oil patch that we have reached out to MLive to get a commodities expert and join us this morning. I mean, China yesterday <laughs> intervening in the market by releasing strategic reserves for the first time in history, at the same time as the U.S. is releasing strategic reserves to Exxon for the second time in just a couple of days. Hurricane Ida dropped the input or the output, I should say, uh, of oil, um, the most in U.S. history. Shell is declaring a force majeure, and there's a ton going on in gas as well. Here you can see um, that oil uh, is poised for its first weekly loss uh, in three weeks, or, well, it was. It looks like it's doing a little bit better because of today's rebound. But joining us is Eddie Vandervald of Bloomberg Markets Live to talk about um, the Texas tea. Eddie, although I watch Brent uh, more closely than, than uh, WTI, what, what do you make of all these moves in oil? Yeah, look, really interesting. I think it is interesting that we're seeing that move from China at the same time as the move from the U.S., but they are very different in character, right? And the U.S., it is a response yes. to a short-term, you know, supply crunch. China's stated aim here is to affect prices. 
And I think they've not, they're not particularly successful. And they haven't been in other commodities either. We've seen them do it in copper. The copper price has been steady, but that's more a, re a reflection of delta and of slowing demand for copper than it is for pure, you know, that, that China is affecting the price. If China s releases reserves, ultimately they will have to replenish because they are not a major producer. So, Eddie, when you look at the price of oil right now and the way it goes and the volatility that we could see, what will it move on? The price of oil? Yeah. I, 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 price of oil, I mean, the price of oil now is, is, is very vulnerable to me because I think on the, on, the, on the one hand, we are looking at a delta and a, you know, a global slowdown, those, those kind of fears. But on the other, if those fears are overbaked, I think OPEC has signaled that it will pump into rallies. OPEC is comfortable with these kind of prices. They would rather, you know, maintain market share or grain gain greater market share. So I think the, the oil price, the, the upside here is capped because, you know, because of those factors, because OPEC will just mm. pump it to death. Well, let's talk about the upside possible for the base metals from here, Eddie. You have nickel, aluminum right around record highs. You have the likes of Goldman Sachs and Citigroup raising their targets for it. Do you think this rally can continue? You know, it's such an interesting question, and I think it's, it's really key for the global inflation picture. Because, you know, for, 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 for raw materials to keep uh, fueling inflation, and there are other drivers as well, but for raw materials to matter, they, they can't just be elevated and stay there. They need to continue rallying. And for some of these metals, yes, there are, there are real supply constraints that we are worried about in the short term. But, you know, we've already come an awful long way since March last year. I think we are in a very long term commodity super cycle that will you know boost copper prices but in the medium term and the short term copper and other metals have gone an awful long way eddie thank you so much eddie van der Valt there from our bloomberg markets live team now coming up we'll look at dollar we'll look at dollar dynamics and we'll have plenty more also on commodities this is bloomberg Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York with Francine Lacqua in London and Matt Miller in Berlin. Now let's get the first word news and New Zealand went into lockdown a month ago after discovering one coronavirus case. Today the government reported 11 new cases in the city of Auckland. That's the lowest number since the first days of the stay at home order. Toyota is cutting its production forecast for the fiscal year by 300,000 vehicles, a roughly 3% reduction. The Japanese automaker blames the spread of the coronavirus in Southeast Asia, along with the semiconductor shortage. Last month, Toyota warned that cutbacks were coming. Harvard University has agreed to stop investing in fossil fuels. Instead, the university will use its $42 billion endowment to support the green economy. Harvard students have protested for years, calling for fossil fuel divestment. And BlackRock is rethinking its October return to office plans for U.S. employees. The world's largest asset manager says the spread of the Delta variant calls for a more flexible approach. According to a memo, BlackRock is now telling employees that it hasn't decided when it would like to see them at their desks at least a few days a week. And Matt, this also echoes what we heard from Microsoft yesterday. They were expecting a return to the office on October 4th. They have now delayed that indefinitely, saying it's too hard to set a date with the pandemic so unpredictable. Yeah, you're going to see, uh, well, we had a great story yesterday on the big take about this. Mm -hmm. um, really a mixture of uh, companies that are mandating vaccines, companies um, that are mandating testing, companies that are bringing workers back into the offices, companies that have decided not to do that. And um, it, everything seems very up in the air right now. There's no, uh, there's no unifying trend. We, have, I guess, have to wait for some of the booster shots. I mean, it's interesting that overall, so Singapore has one of the highest cases since last year, but they're not going into lockdown. So, you know, companies are being very cautious. Corporates are being very cautious, possibly because they're uh, concerned about getting sued. But then you have countries actually taking more risks if they have a critical level of vaccination. So it's interesting to see the, the difference approach, you know, at, at the government level and at the corporate level. Now, coming up, we'll talk a lot more about the markets. Luke Kawa, UBS Asset Management Director of investment solutions. I loved, 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 uh, Matt, your chart earlier on with uh, some of the things that we need to watch out for oil. It's going to be actually a pretty busy week next week for the markets. Yeah, a very busy week. And also this weekend, um, a lot to 
pay attention to. Do you know MotoGP is back in Aragon <laughs> and Maverick Vinales is racing for Yamaha oh, he now? <laughs> um, or for Aprilia now, excuse me. So it'll be interesting to see how he does. I guess he's going to finish in the bottom five, but probably ahead of Valentino Rossi. And football, Matt, don't forget. Oh, yeah, NFL. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Matt Miller in Berlin. Kelly Lines in New York. Matt, as we look at the markets, I know we're looking at more and more banks uh, coming up with putting meat on the bone. Not only, you know, we're worried about valuations, but for example, Deutsche Bank uh, seeing the risk of a hard equity valuation correction. Yeah, and we're hearing that now from um, more and more people. Goldman Sachs coming out with the call for um, the possibility of a, a, of a drop as well. And... Of course, you've got um, some members of the Federal Reserve selling off all their equity holdings. A lot of people are saying, hmm, does that signal a top? Maybe that means <laughs> it's the end. They can start to raise rates now if you want to be very cynical about it. We're not cynical. The markets are not <laughs> cynical, certainly not the bond market, Kaylee. <laughs> Yeah, well, let's talk about the equity market as well, Francine, because we've had several days of losses in a row, both here in the U.S. and in Europe. But it looks like those losing streaks may snap on this Friday, because right now the stock 600 is higher by about two tenths of one percent. You have sectors like consumer and basic resources leading the way there. And here in the U.S., S&P 500 futures are right around the highs of the session, up about four tenths of one percent. In the bond market, we are seeing yields tick higher by the better part of three basis points, which basically means we're ending the week right where we started at around 132. And then, of course, we've been paying attention to the commodity complex. China releasing oil reserves. What does the demand picture look like right now? Oil is rebounding off of the losses we saw yesterday, up about 1.4% on WTI. It's trading at $69.09 a barrel. As for some movers in pre-market trading, Apellis Pharmaceuticals is a big mover to the downside. Disappointing results from one of its trials for ge geographic atrophy, which is an eye condition. So that stock is down about 30%. But another company working on a treatment for that same condition is getting a boost from its competitors' pain today. It's up about 23, 28% for Ivrick Bio. Then two other stocks moving to the upside. Affirm Holdings had a strong quarter after the bell last night. It's up 23%. And then Catapult Holdings, maybe the latest meme stock because it's up 74 percent in the last two weeks and is looking to add to those gains today up about 19 percent before the bell francine kaylee markets may be a risk of a sell-off we've heard that from banks but today we've heard it also from deutsche bank strategists who say that high stock valuations and a rapidly advancing earning cycle is a risk bank of america savita subramanian also speaking to bloomberg about where she sees vulnerability the S and P 500 has essentially turned into a 36 year zero coupon bond. If you look at the duration of the market today, it's basically longer duration than it's ever been. So what that means is that any move higher in the cost of capital, be it interest rates, credit spreads, equity risk premia, that's basically going to be a huge knock on the market relative to, to the sensitivity we've seen in the past. Well, joining us now to talk markets, we dragged him out of bed. It's early in the morning. Luke Kawa, Asset Allocation Strategist at UBS Asset Management. Luke, so good to speak to you. When you look at some of the market valuations, so are, are we actually going to see a pullback in markets or could we see a correction, which just means we're going to get less returns, but not, you know, stocks falling out of bed? So, so here we're, we're kind of looking more at the, the next 10, 20, 30 percent in equities rather than the next five. I think, you know, there's any number of reasons why equities could have a 5 percent correction. But I think uh, I, I think some of the, the logic laid out in that clip holds in terms of where would you expect it to, to play out. So recently, I think what we've seen over the past, call it two and two and a half months, is kind of a more of a re-rating of the cyclical reopening trade, uh, so to speak, than, than anything else. So if we did get a, uh, a uh, slight correction in equities, we would think would be concentrated uh, more in the, the high-valued growth stocks, uh, mainly in the U.S., 
And uh, if you look at kind of the suite or the balance of risks to equities right now, uh, I, I would suggest that a lot of the downside growth risks are what has been realized. Whereas on the other hand, the, the policy risks, whether it be from U.S. tax being something that more directly affects the earnings power of American only companies and in particular, uh, perhaps cyclical growth companies if you get more of that uh, minimum tax on book income or a, a guilty tax increase and mm -hmm. as well the the macro concerns if we're looking at the possibility for real yields to rise that's something mm -hmm. that should weigh more acutely on uh, u.s secular growth and that's not an area of the market that we prefer luke when you look at i i, I like to pull up the ge function on the bloomberg um to look at pe's and just try and find industry groups you know sectors where there still is some value and where that could increase where, where do you how do you screen for these things and, and where do you see value so yeah you know, I, I think the starting point uh which you've alluded to is that you know valuations on an outright basis no doubt they're expensive uh however if you look at kind of the the earnings yield so yeah can measure it a, a trillion different ways, but essentially de deflating the uh, how much equities are expected to earn by the the relative uh, bond market yield. It's it's clear that you're kind of around the floor of last cycle, so you should expect uh, equities to be more in line with earnings going forward as a general matter. But where the the valuation is is most kind of uh, attractive to us are markets like uh, Europe and Japan, and if we're looking within sectors, uh, more energy and financials. So these are places with still a, a very healthy earnings yield. And if we're looking at a regional basis, we we can't just think about valuation. Valuation without mm -hmm. catalyst is is an insufficient so we, uh, thesis for a position. So what we actually like is is the fact that you do see some catalyst both in Japan in terms of uh, the election shaking shaping up, COVID improving. And in terms of Europe being one of the few places, uh, if any, in the world where growth is actually expected to pick up from 2022 to 2021. Luke, while we're talking about relative yield, let's talk about the bond market. Do you think we have seen the bottom and or top in yields this year? Uh, uh, we think that we've seen the the bottom in yields uh, this year for for sure. It's also it's also possible that that, that we've seen the top. However, uh, for for 2022 uh, for 2021 at least. Uh, however, we do expect yields to be moving higher from here. Uh, if there's a story that the market has been underestimating uh, in our view, it's that the the runway for strong growth is is so much longer this cycle than it is last cycle, and you know that's that's in large part due to to inventory disruptions. Uh, due to the fact that uh, household incomes continue to draw, grow at a, an extremely strong clip, uh, even though and they're further bolstered by the amount of excess savings that also still remain. So that, that's something we see as uh, the, the direction of travel is likely up, but it has to be a global phenomenon. I think mm. what we saw last cycle is the, the ability of U.S. yields to really break away from the rest of the world is something that's going to be limited because the Federal Reserve understands that that has negative spillovers in terms of the, the U.S. Yeah. dollar and the effect on domestic growth and good sensitive sectors. Uh, Luke, what exactly is priced in Chinese assets right now? That's a that's a good question. I think it, it's, what's really important is to choose your preferred uh, metric uh, of Chinese equities. If you look at, uh, for instance, CSI 500, um, a broader measure, more more small cap equities, it's performed actually quite 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 well, quite uh, uh, even among global uh, global small caps relative to, to its peers. However, the the major large cap equities, they, there's a fair degree of, of risk premium priced in to, to Chinese equities at this juncture. That's a, that's an area we've actually been reducing our underweight to, to China with NEM, mm -hmm. so uh, effectively buying back some more Chinese equities. And what we're more focused on is the ability for Chinese macroeconomic policy to stabilize ahead of any turn in Chinese regulatory policy. So we're looking at yeah. the spillovers from what happens when Chinese growth stabilize and where you want to be when that happens. And we, we think that's kind of the more cyclical regions and sectors. Well, let's pivot over to another region, Europe. I was cracking up, Luke, at your tweets yesterday around Madame Lagarde's press conference. Is there a difference between recalibrating and tapering? There's always a difference when central banks use different words to make you think there's a difference, I think is kind of the, the only way to answer that question. And I think one thing we've learned about the, the withdrawal of monetary stimulus is that uh, a lot is, of it is in how central banks manage it. You know, for instance, in 2013, when it's an abrupt uh, 
offhand comment to tapering in a place where nobody expected it, it right. has a huge effect on real yields. But when we spend the entire year talking about talking about tapering and who's talking about tapering when and for how long and when that might actually lead to a reduction in bond purchases that's something that's a conversation that just dulls the impact one mm -hmm. would suspect it to have over time yeah a lot of people Luke, just think that actually central banks are being too kind to the markets they should just get on with it without all of this guidance Luke Kawa asset allocation strategist at UBS asset management now coming up more pay for junior bankers we'll bring in our interview with Ken Molis that's coming up shortly and this is Bloomberg This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later on today, a firm CEO and PayPal co-founder, Max Levchin. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York with Francine Lacqua in London and Matt Miller in Berlin. Well, the competition to retain junior bankers is getting more and more intense. Ken Mollis weighs in in an exclusive interview with Bloomberg. Business is booming. And, you know, someone like our firm, I think our last quarter, we were up 100% year over year. And our, our people are up 10%. So you could just do the math. Somebody's working very hard. <laughs> and, and I think they deserve to, to be paid more. Joining us now is Shanali Basik, Bloomberg's Wall Street correspondent. So, Shanali, what I find fascinating about what Ken Mollis just said is basically the good times keep on rolling for these banks. Therefore, they can afford to pay their people more. So how long is this going to last? Uh, it could last a while. We know that some other activities have slowed down, at least for this late summer, like IPOs. However, private equity is still sitting on records amount of money. They keep on raising a records amount of money. And they are, you know, regardless of what happens to the banks in terms of M&A, a firm like Mollis & Company, all of these independent banks are faring quite well because there's still a lot of money sitting in SPACs, and uh, they, they are considered independent. They're, they're considered the ones that are getting the deal done and focusing on largely that and not trading in other capital intensive businesses. <laughs> Shanali, if you were starting out your career all over again today, <laughs> would you stay in New York and work on Wall Street, or would you head out to the left coast and work for tech? Uh, you know, I'm not going to answer for myself, Matt, <laughs> but that is certainly a question that is on the minds of a lot of young people. You know, Molas and company, and I'm hearing of now a few others, are entering a new vertical. Crypto comes to mind. FinTech creator economy. Goldman now is all about the creator economy. And those kinds of things, A, they're not always in New York. Literally, the clients are in Austin, in Denver, in California. They're all over the place. In Florida, Florida, the regulatory environment for some of those businesses is much simpler. So, you know, to be a banker today, mm. your job is different than when a lot of the folks that are at the top of these firms have started. Well, and it's not all about the money anymore, is it? I mean, you do still want a lot of money, I'm sure, um, and especially the chance to increase um, your wealth over time. But there are other aspects that are equally important to today's young hires. Certainly. And, you know, you look at these firms, and more and more when I talk to young people who are choosing fintechs or tech companies, because remember, the big tech companies are in need of a lot of people with not just financial skills, but some of these coding skills that bankers now also have, they turn their nose up at the bank. Because the idea that they will kind of reign prominent forever is something that's also not attractive uh, to these young people. I've also got to say, in this business of M&A, Goldman, Morgan Stanley, and Morgan, uh, Goldman, J.P. Morgan, and Morgan Stanley each have between 20 and 30 percent of the market share. After that, it drops off by a lot. So even if you're doing deal making, you have to question um, whether and where you're going to get the best uh, experience right. so, overall. So, Shanali, is there anything that banks can do to try and adapt to, to make sure that they get the best young staff, even, you know, either from tech companies or fintech? Well, 
beyond pay, which is something that has been attractive to young people, and, you know, beyond flexibility, because a lot of people walking into this job know that they're not going to get flexibility, is time in front of clients, is time that is spent knowing that their career is going somewhere and uh, towards valuable experiences that they can enjoy. All right, Shanali, thanks so much. Uh, Bloomberg's Wall Street reporter, Shanali Bazak. Now, coming up, we'll talk vaccine mandates with Andrew Pekosh, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health professor and virologist. He's coming up at 6.30 a.m. in New York, 11.30 a.m. in London. And this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lackman, London. Matt Miller in Berlin. Kaylee Lines in New York. Now, tomorrow marks the 20th anniversary of the attacks of September 11th. Wall Street Week reflects back on the events. America heard the news as it was going to work, going to school, or just waking up. An airplane is reportedly has crashed into the World Trade Center. That is a live shot. 17 minutes after the first plane hit the World Trade Center's North Tower, a second plane hit the South Tower. Oh my God. President Bush was in Florida visiting an elementary school. His chief of staff leaned over and whispered, America is under attack. A third plane crashed into the Pentagon. A fourth plane appeared to be heading to Washington, but it crashed in Pennsylvania after passengers and crew tried to regain control from the hijackers. By then, the FAA had taken an unprecedented step. Every airline in U.S. airspace was ordered to land at the nearest airport. Three days later, President Bush went to ground zero. What became known as the global war on terrorism was about to begin. I can hear you, the rest of the world hears you, and the people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. Wall Street never opened on 9-11. The open was delayed after the first plane struck and then canceled after the second plane crashed. Markets wouldn't open until the following Monday. It was the longest shutdown since the Great Depression. Once trading resumed, there was a massive sell-off, the biggest one-day loss in the history of the New York Stock Exchange. The Dow Jones Industrials were down 14 percent, but by early October, stocks were back up to where they'd been the day before the attacks. Almost an entire generation has grown up since 9-11. On this 20th anniversary, many will join those who can never forget that day and remember the nearly 3,000 people who were lost. And Bloomberg LP, the parent company of Bloomberg News, has lost, also lost three people on September 11th, 2001. You can watch more of our coverage on the anniversary tonight on Wall Street Week. Now, Tom Keane joins us. Tom, you're exceptionally good at capturing these emotions and, of course, reflections. What will be on your mind tomorrow? Uh, my mind tomorrow is the resiliency of New York City. And I'll tell you, I mean, I remember going down, I was actually looking in an apartment, Francine, a number of years ago in the rebound in Lower Manhattan. Nobody expected that at all. Not only did Lower Manhattan rebound, all rebounded. I'd suggest Washington rebounded. Admiral Stravitas told us the Pentagon, where he was the day of 9-11. Uh, Admiral Stravitas told us the Pentagon has rebounded as well. Well, and Tom, two decades later, it's no longer about the rebound from a terror attack like this. It's the rebound from the pandemic, and that's relevant here in New York City and elsewhere. Uh, it is, and I, I, to put it in scale, the chart of what we do here at Bloomberg, it is a standard and poor's 500, and just simply shows what we did after 9-11. David Weston captured that with the uncertainties of 30 days, and then a rebound, and then, of course, the financial crisis of 2007 and eight. And nine, and then up we go, and many will say why we have exploded higher. This is a normalized chart showing percentage change. And along the way, Kaylee, the pandemic is a blip. I want to ask about the, uh, the market today, Tom. We've had more and more analysts come out, um, strategists come out and say we could be 
yep. looking at a correction, yep. Deutsche Bank, Goldman Sachs, mm -hmm. Morgan Stanley. Is this starting to become um, a, a, a real concern for investors? Oh, come on, Matt. You've been doing this since time began. We sh uh, David Weston showed Dylan Radigan there on the ancient TV of Bloomberg. And I, I remember there. you, Matt Miller, Kaylee <laughs> Miller, he, he still was getting carded in bars. It was so <laughs> long ago. And Matt Miller, you know and I know that when the narrative gets like that, watch out. Everybody's on the wrong side. I loved what Kaylee had on Dominic Wilson of Goldman Sachs, the idea how everybody's narrowed down their guesstimates because they don't have a clue. <laughs> yeah, but to put it simply, Tom, thank you. You can't, thank can't you imagine Matt for... Miller when he was 17 working for Bloomberg. I mean, it was almost under. Yeah, was... full set of hair, <laughs> so I'm know. told. He, back, he actually no. worked a real day back then. <laughs> really? Um, now, a, a look at what else we're watching today. I feel like I need to give you, you know, right of reply first of all, Matt. Well, uh, you know, I'm just happy to have the half days. Now that I'm older and I've got um, a, a little bit more experience and, and, and time put in, then I, I get to go home, I take the surveillance nap, you know, and then I come back later just to watch what's going on. <laughs> That's what, you know, seniority gives you. I think Tom also has a surveillance nap. Uh, Kaylee, you're looking at data today. And also looking forward to taking a nap later because it's Friday, Francine. But yes, economic data, 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. We're going to get the PPI read for August. The headline number for the year-on-year -year number could be massive. 8.2% is what economists are expecting. When you back out food and energy, they're expecting 6.6%. And then for the month-on-month -month measure, 6 tenths of 1%. But obviously a very key read on inflation. How much are some of those supply chain issues, those bottlenecks, still impacting producers? And are we going to start to see more of a follow-on from that when we get the C PI uh, print next week, Matt. Uh, yeah, well, definitely going to continue to keep my eye on that and um, also focusing on the German elections here. Our Ian Rogers in Berlin has a great story about how a Schultz-led government could transform Germany and Europe. I think the main question on um, voters' minds, at least the voters that, that I talk to, is will Schultz um, get together with the FDP and the Greens, the Liberals, and the uh, climate concerned, or will he get together with Die Linke, the former Communist Party? That is a real possibility and maybe one that'll swing the balance. Yeah, I have to say the path forward for coalition building is probably not uh, the easiest thing to look at right now. Matt, I'm looking at the UK economy, so first of all, barely growing. In July, this suggests that the recovery from the coronavirus recession may be tougher than expected. It seems like it's rapidly leveling off. Consumer spending actually is weakening and supply disruptions hamper production. And then you couple on top of that, that tax hike that we heard earlier uh, this week, and we could see on the markets a difference between the way the FTSE goes and to other countries countries such as France, who this morning said, look, we're not going into austerity for the 2022 budget. Partly is because we're looking at a presidential election in April 2022, and no one wants to hike uh, inter or hike taxes right before an election. Now, more Bloomberg surveillance is coming up ahead. We'll hear from David Page of AXA and many more.